Hello, Cries and Whispers. Bergman wrote the script for Cries and Whispers, as he did for many other films, in hermetic isolation on Faroe Island off the Swedish coast. And just as the film is composed of flashbacks by Agnes and Maria, Karen and Anna, so too Bergman was drawing on his own memories as he planned the script. Um, there are two recollections in particular worth noting uh, as we explore this extraordinary film. First, Bergman explained that his expressionistic use of red as an all-pervasive color within the manor house arose from his sense that, quote, ever since my childhood I have pictured the inside of the soul as a moist membrane in shades of red. As I noted last time, soul is a vexed word in Bergman's work because throughout his films the desperate human longing for God and for transcendence usually fails. And even the faith in God that we see in the dying Agnes in his films typically often proves to be elusive and unreliable. What is at issue in Cries and Whispers, however, is not primarily the frustrating and painful search for God's existence, as we find, say, in the seventh seal through a glass darkly in winter light. While Bergman does address this lifelong concern in the minister's tortured invocation after Agnes's death, Christianity in the film operates primarily not as a form of faith that the characters are seeking, so much as a set of powerful metaphors for understanding their relationships, experiences, and deepest feelings. Agnes is unquestionably in this respect a Christ figure, a loving and forgiving woman whose death is evoked at times as a long crucifixion, uh, one that fills her both with dread but also with spiritual resignation. But Bergman removes any suggestion that in dying, uh, Agnes is taking on the sins, the spiritual sickness of her inattentive sisters and redeeming them in the process because, alas, this simply does not happen. Ultimately, no redemption of a Christian kind seems to emerge within this film. Now, throughout Cries and Whispers, Bergman incorporates Christian symbolism and frames uh, scenes and images that recall religious iconography, most powerfully, I think, in the Pietà scene in which the housekeeper, Anna, cradles Agnes's head on her breast as Mary holds the body of the dead Christ. We also find a mysterious scene of what seems like a resurrection from the dead. And throughout the film, Bergman uses a complex interplay of blood and wine and presents meals that appear to incorporate the iconography of communion um, but nonetheless, he does not endorse any theological meaning, uh, but rather, as I've suggested, I think, is using Christian uh, symbolism in figurative ways uh, to investigate that red membrane of the character's innermost being, which in this film is, I think, what he means by the soul, not a spiritual dimension per se. Indeed, if we take Bergman's reference to soul, then, to mean not a spiritual part of our being, but rather our innermost self, the all-pervasive use of the color red functions expressionistically to evoke what is deepest and most intrinsic in all four of the film's women. It operates in shifting registers to wreck feelings of uh, sexual desire, maternal love, betrayal, rage, physical anguish, certainly in uh, Agnes, and self-mutilation. Uh, and many of these meanings associated with red and the innermost layers of a character's being emerge in their interpolated memories. In these flashbacks, Bergman reveals the defining experiences that have made each of the women that we see in the present what they are. What these memories among the women have in common is that each episode focuses on a scene that combines the experience of abandonment, betrayal, and failure in some way, though very different for the women. Now, how these female characters respond uh, to the seminal painful experience uh, that is remembered, uh, how they respond to that is what shapes their life and reveals who they are. Agnes's ability to overcome the lack of maternal love, for example, that she felt as a child has made her profoundly capable of loving because she can forgive and overcome jealousy, having lived through it as a little girl. Her pain has led her to turn outward, generously, toward the world, making her capable of compassion and gratitude. On the other hand, we'll see that the traumatic memories that Karen and Maria summon forth reveal how, in different ways, 
each of these sisters has turned inward. Karen has become bitter, cold, controlling, and terrified of intimacy. Maria, on the other hand, has become narcissistically self-fixated and sexually needy. While Agnes suffers a ravaging illness of the body, we might say that both of her sisters are psychologically sick. Now, while Agnes then uh, has uh, been dying for some time, um, to face her final end, um, the sisters have come back to the childhood home where they grew up together. Uh, and this provides for Karen and for Maria an opportunity for these women to move out of the tight orbit of themselves and their own lives by responding, if they can, to their dying sister's needs. Above all, what Agnes needs and wants as she is dying is to be touched. And through the memories that the manor house elicits, we will see why it is so difficult for these sisters to touch her as she wants to be touched. But unlike the old Professor Isaac, one might say, in Wild Strawberries, whose confrontation with his troubled past in memories proves to be transformative, we'll find that there is no indication, ultimately, that either Karen or Maria, after they have retreated into their past and faced their most traumatic memories, that either one of them is capable of changing as a result. By contrast, the housekeeper Anna's memory episode, though it is more than that, reveals that this longtime family, family servant, whose daughter has recently died, finds in her tireless care for Agnes a replacement for the maternal love that she needs to give, both physically and emotionally. Now, I mentioned that there were two childhood memories that Bergman was drawing upon here. One was the childhood memory of the soul as a, a, a wet red membrane. The other childhood memory is much more specific. Um, and um, he described it in his autobiography, The Magic Lantern. Bergman recalls being shut inside the mortuary of a royal hospital on whose grounds he used to play as a child. In the morgue, he saw a young girl lying under a sheet. He says, quote, I pulled back the sheet and exposed her. She was quite naked, but I touched her shoulder. I heard about the chill of death, but this girl's skin was not cold, but hot. I moved my hand to her breast, which was small and slick with an erect black nipple. There was dark hair down on her abdomen. She was breathing. Now, this eerie experience of the dead seeming to return to life haunted Bergman his entire life, so much so that he alluded to it in the prologue to Persona and had actually planned to incorporate this scene uh, in his film The Hour of the Wolf. He didn't, but he transmits the experience in its own way more fully in Cries and Whispers when Agnes, having been pronounced dead, seems to return to life briefly, drawing from Karen, Maria, and Anna the diverse responses that most fully define them in the film's eeriest and most harrowing scene, and also its most moving and controversial scene. Now, the action of Cries and Whispers seems straightforward at first. It's the Swedish countryside at the turn of the 20th century. We know from the early scenes that Agnes is in the last stages of a fatal cancer that she has been suffering from from several years. Her sisters, who have moved away from the manor house, now have returned to their childhood home in anticipation of her death. But this linear narrative is disrupted by five flashback interpolations. The first and last of these are from Agnes's perspective, in which we hear her voice over and see scenes from her past. In the first, it's her childhood past with her mother, and in the last, it's a recent walk she took on the grounds with Maria and Karen before she died. Now, both of these memories are introduced by a fade to a person dressed in white, at, and the, both of these memories uh, from uh, Agnes then end with a fade to red, uh, the omnipresent color within the diegetic present. Now, the three flashbacks enclosed between Agnes's memory belong in succession to Maria, Karen, and Anna. Each is introduced and closed by red frames in which the memorist's face is half enclosed in shadow. 
when we put the two halves of the face together, the one we get before and after the memory, we get, if you will, a full visual portrait of the remembering individual, just as the memory itself functions as a psychological portrait, uh, as it uh, peels away layers to reveal the character more fully. Now, from the start, um, this reunion of sisters takes place in a world distinguished by wealth and class privilege, but also by imminent and elegiac loss. And in this particular combination of tonal elements, Cries and Whispers unmistakably recalls the Russian dramatist Anton Chekhov's greatest play, Three Sisters, uh, set in the Russian countryside at the same time that Bergman's film about Three Sisters is set in Sweden. It's a no notable thing, I think, that Bergman himself uh, was deeply familiar with Chekhov because he began as a theater director and he continued to direct both plays and operas apart from films throughout his career, uh, even making a superb film of Mozart's The Magic Flute, which he had also directed on stage. Now, while Bergman deliberately echoes the situational and atmospheric aspects of Chekhov's Three Sisters, he does so, at least in part, I think, to draw contrast between the works. Chekhov's sisters are ultimately bound together by their shared suffering in mutual support that allows them to transcend their differences, while Bergman's film reveals a far greater animosity in Karen and Maria, uh, who prove incapable, ultimately, of acting on the loving bonds that they sometimes approach, but never really fully discover and enact. Um, the servant Anna's compassion, by contrast, flows from her without impediment. And in contrasting that selfless love to Karen's coldness and Maria's narcissism, Bergman's film is, among other things, I believe, a scathing satire on the sterility of bourgeois wealth and manners and values, though with a rather different tone, I think, than uh, Bunuel's. Well, with this prologue behind us, let's turn now to some close analysis, beginning with the film's opening. Have a look.
The credits appear against the red brack drop that will dominate the film, and we hear the sound of faint chimes from one of the many clocks in the house. We later realize that this clock that we hear is chiming ahead of the others, uh, marking the hour prematurely. We cut then to the close-up of a weathered female statue seen from behind, and then the surrounding pastoral grounds of a Swedish manor house on a summer morning, where the light has already begun, streaming through the mist. The colors in this exterior, natural world, will be set against the red that dominates the interior of the house. The colors here are green and slightly muted, the shades of grass and trees. It's pastoral a natural place of life and growth and tranquility that will contrast sharply with the impending death, agony, and agitation we find within the house. From the start, then, Bergman establishes a visual language of dialectical opposition, outside versus inside, serenity versus agony, life versus death, the natural sounds of the manor grounds versus the clock time, inside measuring mortality, and one might also say the linear movement of time toward Agnes's inevitable death versus a cyclical sense of time uh, and renewal in nature. Now, reflecting these differences, um, inside the manor house, we hear um, a sound of urgent noise uh, from this clock that has uh, been inescapable. And the fact that we heard the clock while looking at the pastoral setting, I think, points to the inevitable movement to its source. We hear it even when we are outside and looking at the greenery. It's drawing us in. Before we see the occupant of the room into which we move, Agnes, Bergman presents the most ornate and massive timepiece among the very many in the house. As he pans slowly, in close-up over the clock's pendulum and its gilded statuary, the camera's deliberate pace here contrasts with the urgency of the chiming of the clock and the announcement of the hour. Bergman also contradistinguishes this highly artificial clock sculpture from that season-weathered, much more natural-looking female statue that we saw from behind on the grounds, reminding us again of the two different worlds here, the outside and the inside. Now we're inside. Um, it's clear in this opening that Agnes, trapped inside, longs for the vitality and peace of the natural world. We see her gazing out onto the grounds from the window, but she's confined to her room and confined to the looming death sentence that she awaits. The clock reminds her, and it reminds the viewer, that her hours, that her days are numbered. Yet she doesn't turn away from that inevitability. Rather, when Agnes rises from her bed, the first thing she does is to adjust the small clock that we realize had been marking the hour prematurely during the credit sequence. In short, by facing time, she faces death openly here. With fear, yes, but also with a brave sense of resignation. Before she arises, however, before we see that, Bergman gives us two other images. First, we see, before Agnes, a close-up of the beautiful sister Maria, um, who uh, is in the outer room, um, sleeping soundly. She's played by Liv Ullman. Maria's unresponsiveness to the clock chimes prefigures her inattentiveness to Agnes's suffering and needs. Another shot reveals that she is sleeping across two chairs in a makeshift bed near Agnes's bedroom, uh, ostensibly thus so she, that she can be uh, nearby and on hand if she is uh, required. Uh, but Maria, we soon realize, is too ineffectual and absorbed in herself and her own comforts to be of any use to her dying sister, just as she is absorbed in her own slumber when we first see her. Now, like the bedroom, the interior of this outer room, this drawing room, is also all red, and Maria's white nightgown stands out starkly against it. In fact, all of the film's women are going to be dressed in white, largely within Bergman's abstract color scheme. And like red, the color white will encompass a range of meanings from purity on the one hand to death on the other. Only after seeing Maria's non-response do we then get a close-up 
of Agnes, the central figure who has brought her sisters here as she's dying. She is also asleep, but restlessly. A medium shot shows Agnes turning painfully in bed, and her breath is labored. Then an extended close-up shows her transition from sleep to wakefulness, as Agnes' face becomes an expressionistic map or screen of her inner feelings. Playing Agnes, uh, Harriet Anderson's face changes from a register of physical discomfort to a realization as she awakens that she is in her room, that she is alone, and that she is dying. We realize that she makes this same terrible reckoning each time she awakens. It's so terrible, in fact, that Agnes closes her eyes a moment later in an attempt to return to sleep. But the continued close-up shows that she is now gripped by an intense bodily pain that contorts her features. Bergman holds this motionless close-up of Agnes's face for two full minutes, forcing the viewer to see and respond to Agnes's suffering from the start with a sympathetic understanding that her sisters fail to demonstrate. Now, at the end of the clip, Agnes looks out her bedroom uh, door at her still sleeping younger sister, Maria. Once again, the close-up reveals a constellation of shifting inner feelings within Agnes. There is the slight exasperation that Maria would inevitably be asleep, also suggested, of course, by Agnes's slight nod. But there's also a look of affectionate understanding and forgiveness on the face of the dying woman, which characterizes Agnes's response to the world at large. Note that Bergman here links Agnes's suffering with Christ's agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before his crucifixion. Sweating blood in anticipation, you'll recall, Christ asked the apostles to be near him, to watch with him, only to find that they had fallen asleep. Now, like Christ, Agnes finds herself alone then. And a moment later, she goes to her desk and writes in her diary, I am in pain. Just as she uses clocks to measure her dwindling time on earth, so too Agnes records her thoughts and feelings as she moves toward death. Well, you'll note that Bergman's opening combination of extended close-ups, long takes, and minimal camera movement create a sense of oppressive stillness and confinement within the house that reflect Agnes's feelings and that clearly become our feelings as well. We cut to Anna bringing the breakfast tray as the three other women in the house begin their day in ways that <coughs> characterize and contradistinguish them. Maria continues to recline, and uh, from her perspective, we see the doll's house that she kept as a child. Maria's eyes rove in close-up from room to room over the tiny furniture and figures in the doll's house with a look of wistful fascination. Her gaze turns briefly to a painting of her mother, who doted on Maria as a child. Pampered for years because she was so beautiful, Maria has never really grown up. Ironically, she has never become like the adult figures displayed in that doll's house that in so many ways characterizes her failure to develop. Though she has children of her own, in a purely biological sense, she's not much of a mother, and she pursues shallow pleasures and seems incapable of assuming adult responsibilities. Despite the cultivated sexuality that she uses to attract men, Maria's affairs, we'll find, are motivated neither by love nor genuine passion, but rather by a kind of immature, narcissistic need for gratification, for affirmation again and again of her beauty. Meanwhile, Karen, orders Anna to light the fire and acts purposefully, but tensely, and certainly joylessly. We see her first focusing on sewing and then rubbing her forehead as she works with account books. In both shots, Karen is tightly controlled and controlling, as restlessly alert as Maria is indolent and dreamy. Finally, Bergman takes us to Anna's small bedroom, where the servant prepares for the day with a ritual as she kneels at a shrine that she has created, with candles flanking the photograph of her dead daughter. She thanks God for the night's rest and then implores that, quote, Thou who in thy unfathomable wisdom took my daughter unto thyself, will you please watch over and protect the child in the afterlife? This is an affirmation of Christian faith. But it's also a cry of pain to a God whose will uh, Anna accepts but cannot understand. 
Agnes then enters the drawing room. She sees white roses on the table, takes one, sniffs it, and savors the scent and sense and feel of sensual beauty in this white rose as her life is waning. For a moment, Agnes seems lost in the bliss of this moment, but then her face again registers pain as she looks at a single white rose, uh, one that she later paints. A close-up of this white rose, then, brings us to the first of the film's interpolated flashbacks. This one is Agnes's associative memory of her mother, who she links with this white rose. Now, note that Bergman makes this associative transition, uh, both with a dissolve here and also with a graphic matching of the white rose and the mother's white dress, as Agnes recalls it. Have a look. nästan varje dag trots att hon har varit död i över 20 år jag minns att hon ofta sökte sig till ensamheten och stillheten i parken jag minns också att jag brukade följa efter henne på avstånd och själv osedd spionera på henne eftersom jag älskade henne gränslöst och svartskypt jag älskade henne för att hon var så mjuk och vacker och levande för att hon var så närvarande. Men hon kunde också vara kall och avvisande. Eller lite lekfullt grym. Ändå kunde jag inte låta bli att tycka synd om henne. Och nu på äldre dagar förstår jag henne mycket bättre. Jag skulle så gärna vilja möta henne igen och tala om för henne vad jag har förstått om hennes leda och hennes otålighet. Och längtan. Hennes ensamhet. Och att till slut förstod att lilla Greta hade lurat henne. Då minns han börja hennes näsa och växa och växa. På trettonårsafton ställde mor alltid till med kalas. Och då kom tant Olga med sin laterna magika och sina sagor. Jag kände mig alltid rädd och utomför. Och när mor talade till mig på sitt lätta och otåliga sätt så förstod jag knappast vad hon ville mig. Maria och mor hade däremot alltid så mycket att viska om. De var ju också så lika. Jag undrade svart sjukt vad de kunde ha att skratta åt tillsammans. Alla var muntra och upprymda. Det var bara jag som inte kunde delta i glädjen. Jag minns en annan gång. Det var en höst. Jag gömde mig bakom gardinen och Iak tog henne i hemlighet. Hon satt in i röda salongen, klädd i sin vita klänning. Alldeles orörlig med huvudet böjt och händerna vilande mot bordet. Plötsligt upptäckte hon mig kallade på mig med mild röst. Kom. Jag gick tveksamt fram till henne eftersom jag trodde att hon som vanligt skulle anmärka på mig. Men istället såg hon på mig med en blick så full av sorg att jag nästan började gråta. Då lyfte jag min hand och lade den mot hennes kind. Och vi var alldeles nära varandra den gången. Agnes's three childhood memories in this flashback form a kind of triptych as she narrates in voiceover. In the first, she recalls secretly following her mother as she walked alone on the grounds, wanting to be near her mother and filled with a jealous love and longing for maternal attention. Looking back, Agnes understands that she loved her mother's capacity for being alive and present in the moment. It's a trace that Agnes, uh, sniffing that rose, clearly shares with her, just as she shares her mother's early death. Indeed, that early death made the nurturing love that Agnes sought as a little girl and failed to receive from her mother all the more unbearable, because when the mother died, uh, before Agnes had ever received that love, it was forever after that impossible. 
Agnes also knows that her desire for her mother's love increased as a function of the mother's coolness toward her, a dismissive removal that caused Agnes pain. But as an adult, Agnes has come to understand that that cool behavior in her mother was a symptom of the woman's unhappiness, the boredom, loneliness, and impatience of a wealthy woman who feels unfulfilled in her life of leisure. Finally, Agnes's desperate love for her mother was driven by her jealousy for her sister Maria. Lee Ullman, who plays Maria, also plays the mother, suggesting that what the mother loved in Maria was in a sense an image of herself, much as Maria has become a narcissist, but without her mother's capacity for life or real depth of sorrow. Agnes's memory shifts then to a Twelfth Night storytelling session in which she found herself in the familiar position of isolation and jealous longing in the midst of this family gathering. A zoom brings us to the Magic Lantern, a luminous projection device at the turn of the century used to illustrate fairy tales that the ant is telling. Now, this clearly self-reflexive image recalls Bergman's own expressionistic storytelling in the film, but also it recalls the way in which memories and dreams, like films, operate through a process of projection, a projection of mental images, both in our memories and especially in our dreams, as in a film. Well, across the room, Agnes looks and watches her mother whispering affectionately to Maria, and she recalls in this the sting of disregard she felt as a child. But this three-part memory sequence concludes not with bitterness, but rather with Agnes's characteristic understanding and forgiveness. The understanding, indeed, in Agnes is what makes her forgiveness of her mother and all others possible. When she is summoned from behind the curtain in this scene, Agnes describes, quote, a look of sorrow on her mother's face that nearly drove her then to tears. The expression filled Agnes with sympathetic love because as a lonely child, Agnes recognized the same loneliness on her mother's face that she so often feels. In this shared <coughs> suffering in this moment, Agnes realizes that she is really more akin to her mother than Maria is. And her gesture of placing her hand on her mother's cheek and the mother's expression uh, that um, we see here suggests that the mother recognizes that similarity that the two have in the pain of loneliness as much as Agnes does. They are bound together in this moment, paradoxically, by a mutual understanding of the other's painful isolation. And for this moment, in that recognition, they relieve each other of that isolation. Agnes cherishes this moment of intimacy in which her mother revealed to her an underlying melancholy that no one else saw. Uh, it was as if a kind of secret, confidential disclosure to Agnes alone. Now note, that this is, this savored moment of the past, a moment of touch in a film in which touch really means far more than words ever can. As Agnes faces death, she longs desperately for that maternal touch that she experienced only once in this moment with her mother. She craves the sensuality and warmth, in short, of the maternal body. Uh, that her mother largely denied her and that her sisters cannot or will not provide. But it is a maternal warmth that Anna, as we'll see, offers her with the warmth, the literal warmth, of her own maternal breast. Now, when the doctor arrives, he listens to Agnes's heart, lays hands on her gently but professionally. That's not the touch she wants. That's not the intimate touch she craves. But at least it is a touch, and so she clasps the doctor's hand in both of hers and pulls them to her body, craving more physical human contact. Just before the doctor leaves, he strokes Agnes's face as her mother had with a look of sympathy. But it's not a moment of their shared pain as it had been with her mother, because the doctor and Agnes inhabit two different realms, the realm of the healthy and the realm of the dying. Outside the door, the doctor, named David, tells Karen, quote, I don't think it will be long now. A moment later, after the doctor has left her dying sister, Maria tries to renew an affair with him. We find that he is an old lover of hers, and she also almost succeeds. But David's departure, his abrupt rejection of Maria, 
triggers in Maria a memory that, like Agnes's, strikes at the heart of Maria's character. Have a look. Now, Maria's gesture of bringing the doctor's hands to her breast recalls Agnes doing the same thing moments earlier. But whereas Agnes had sought comfort from the doctor, Maria wants erotic gratification, as, she, as her moans indicate. But much more than David's touch, what gratifies Maria is his gaze at her. His sensual, uh, her sensual beauty seems to hold the doctor, and Maria's greatest pleasure is her awareness that he cannot resist looking at her. It's a version of narcissism in which his expression of arousal confirms Maria's idea of her own beauty. He functions, in short, as a kind of mirror for her in which she can admire herself. But after kissing her, David pulls away and leaves, triggering her flashback of another moment of emotional abandonment. Now, throughout the scene, she remembers the doctor, uh, with the doctor. The left side of Maria's face, you remember, has been in shadow at the beginning, suggesting that there are aspects of her character that are still submerged, origins of her behavior that are yet to be revealed. Well, they're going to be revealed now in this flashback memory as we fade to red, and that brings us to a close-up of her face, this time with the right side of her face shaded. The flashback is introduced, not, however, in Maria's own voice, as Agnes's was accompanied by her own voiceover, but rather Maria's comes from a non-diegetic narrator, thereby reducing the audience's emotional involvement in the memory and with Maria. Now, we're going to see two different scenes in Maria's memory sequence, both of which trace back to a few years earlier. The first comes when the doctor came to treat Anna's daughter, possibly for the illness that took the little girl's life. Maria urged David that night to stay for dinner and then to spend the night, advising him that her husband Joachim was away on business and that Agnes, already sick then, was traveling in Italy with Karen. It is already clear at this point that they had been lovers some years earlier. Now, while David eats dinner, Bergman frames his glass of red wine against the backdrop of Maria's ample cleavage in a red gown, which she offers to his gaze, challenging him to resist her. As they talk, we get an extended two-shot as Maria tries to seduce him, and then, as she had tried in the present uh, to seduce him uh, during his professional visit, um, she wants to use a professional visit then and now um, in order to promote her own carnal pleasure, her own narcissistic disregard. And it is notable, you'll see, I think, both in the memory and in the moment in the present with the doctor, Maria is utterly incapable of guilt. Now, she succeeded, in a sense, in the flashback, in reinitiating her affair with the doctor that had uh, commenced even years earlier before the flashback, but only after she has been emotionally rejected, only after he has denounced her. Now, the second uh, part of the sequence in this flashback comes a day later. As Maria lies clumsily about the doctor's visit to her husband, Joachim sees through it, realizes that she has slept with her former lover, and attempts suicide. Have a look at Maria's encounter in memory, first with 
David the doctor, and then with her husband. Ser i spegeln. Du är vacker. Kanske är du vackrare nu än på vår tid. Men du har förändrats. Jag vill du ska se att du har förändrats. Dina ögon kastar nu mina snabba kalkylerande sidoblickar. Förr såg du rakt fram. Öppet. Utan att maskera dig. Din mun har fått ett litet drag av missnöje och hunger. Förr var den bara mjuk. Din hy är nu mera blek. Du sminkar dig. Den fina breda pannan har fått fyra rispråa för vardera ögonbrynet. Nej, det kan du inte se det här ljuset. Men det syns i skarpt dagsljus. Vet du var de där risperna kommer ifrån? Nej. Det är likgiltigheten, Marie. Och den här fina linjen från öra till hakspetsen. Den är inte så självklar längre. Där sitter bekvämligheten och lättjan. Och ser du här vid nesroten. Varför honlär du så ofta, Marie? Kan du se det? Du honlär för ofta. Ser du, Marie? Och under ögonen. De vassa, nästan omärkliga rynkorna av leda och otålighet. Kan du verkligen se allt det där i mitt ansikte? Nej, men jag känner det när du kysser mig. Jag tror du driver med mig. Jag vet var du ser det. Så, vad skulle det vara? Du ser dig där själv. Därför att vi är så lika, du och jag. Du menar... Själviskheten? Kylan? Likgiltigheten. Dina resonemang har nästan alltid tråkat ut mig. Finns det inga förmildrande omständigheter när det gäller sådana som du och jag? Jag har inte behov av någon nåd. Jag vill att vi ska stanna över påskhelgen. Jag tycker det skulle vara ganska trevligt. Jag menar som omväxling. Vad säger du om saken? Vi får väl se. Joakim? Joakim? Thank <laughs> you. 
The most striking feature of David's reading of Maria's character through the map of her face is how her continual smile indicates that she is both disinterested in and essentially denying everything he's telling her about herself. He wants her to look at herself. She only cares about looking at herself as a beautiful image, not look deeply, as he tries to insist. He claims that he can see lines of cold indifference in her face, caused by a life of luxury and laziness, and that he can detect the start of wrinkles that betray uh, Maria's chronic boredom and impatience. Now, this may be accurate, um, but all Maria sees, all she wants to see, all she is capable of seeing is her own beauty reflected in this mirror into which the doctor is making her stare, just as in the present tense uh, event um, that triggered this, um, she saw his face as a kind of mirror for her self-regard. Now, Maria's smile as she looks into the mirror is a habitual narcissistic response to her physical beauty. But it's also a response to her awareness that even as David is diagnosing her character flaws and denouncing her, he is also looking intently at her reflected face and by doing so, ratifying her sense of her female allure, gazing at her as she always wants to be gazed at by men. Well, Maria dismisses his reading of her superficiality and selfishness as nothing more than a joke, or she suggests maybe a projection of the doctor's own traits onto her because he allows that he is himself a selfish man. But Maria doesn't disavow his words, per se, because um, they have in any way pricked her conscience. No, uh, it's not that she's dismissing them because in some way they make her uncomfortable, uh, any more than betraying her husband has caused her any real sense of guilt. As she puts it, quote, I have no need for pardon. She's guilt-proof. Maria dismisses what David says because she is merely bored by his analysis and knows that he can't and won't resist her anyway. So while she submits to this lecture, it's with a certain sense of exasperated impatience since as far as she's concerned, they're going to sleep together in ce fait accompli. Not unlike Catherine in Jules and Jim, Maria depends upon the male gaze for her pleasure. But she also, again like Catherine, resents patriarchy for the restrictions that imposes on her freedom and her sexual pleasure. Um, uh, now, it is certainly true that while Cries and Whispers is directed by a male, it is the only film thus far in the semester we have watched that is rendered from female points of view. Um, and while that may perhaps qualify what I'm about to argue here, uh, I think it's nonetheless important that Bergman is trying very hard to get within this mind of four different women. Now, with regard to Maria, one could argue that Maria's hyperfemininity, this exaggerated femininity that she puts on display, is an example of what Marianne Doan describes when she cites the psychologist, early 20th century psychologist, Joan Riviere's concept of, quote, the masquerade of womanliness. According to Riviere, some women strategically, quote, overdo the gesture of feminine flirtation in order to conceal beneath this alluring, seductive softness their drive for power and pleasure that patriarch patriarchal codes and restrictions deny them. Thus, they hide behind an exaggerated womanliness their own desire for power and their own angry discontentment. Now, don't characterize this exaggerated femininity as a mask one through which women um, who adopt it seem to, quote, confound the masculine structure of the look, um, which in both film and society assigns women to the role of the passive object of the male gaze. Now, one could, I think, argue that Maria subverts this male visual economy in the way that Riviere describes and that Doan does as well. She disrupts the male system of looking without directly challenging patriarchy by offering herself to the male gaze um, as a hyper-feminized spectacle, not as something seen voyeuristically and objectified, but rather openly. Uh, and in doing so, I think like Catherine in Jules and Jim, 
she compellingly reverses the power relations by controlling the male look, aware of it, and drawing it to her deliberately. In the process, then, Maria gains a sense of power, but without appropriating and challenging masculinity in any way that would draw patriarchal rebuke. It's all under the guise of soft femininity. Now, note that Maria also gains pleasure from this masquerade, through her, uh, but that her gratification never takes her ultimately beyond the circuit of female narcissism that Doan laments is the paradigm of female film viewing. Um, nevertheless, the ability to control the male gaze is for Maria a compensatory satisfaction um, for a woman who not only looks like her mother, but who shares her mother's sense of pampered boredom and constriction and dissatisfaction. Yet, Maria's masquerade of hyperfemininity and her attempts to seduce men uh, with her beauty has its limits. When she tries to play the role of obliging wife and dutiful mother, for example, another aspect of hyperfemininity before her husband Joachim, he immediately sees through to it. He detects her infidelity in the very exaggerated nature of this feminine performance. As he prepares to kill himself, he looks at Maria, not with desire, but gazes at her with a look of farewell because he expects, in fact, that he will in f succeed in killing himself. Maria's own expression here isn't one of guilt, but of humiliation, of discomfort at being exposed. It has nothing to do with the transaction with her own conscience. She follows Joachim into his study, but when she sees that he has stabbed himself, she does nothing. And when he, weepingly, changing his mind now, calls repeatedly for her to help him, Maria backs away in revulsion and murmurs, no. It's the same word and the same gesture and the same expression that will she, she will show later when Agnes, as she is nearing death, calls for her help. And even more, when Agnes seemingly returned from the dead, again, wants her. She does nothing. She removes herself. Both the husband and Agnes are stricken uh, at the moment that they summon Maria. They are afraid to die, but in both cases Maria turns away when tactile action, physical touch, is needed. Because the only touch that Maria understands is erotic contact, as we shall soon see. By contrast, when we return to the present, Agnes is calling for Maria to come to her side, craving the maternal touch that she's longed for since childhood and needs most as she faces death and knows that Anna and Anna alone will give her. Have a look. Anna, come to me. Luktar jag väldigt illa. Jag har så ont, Anna. Jag vet det, Agnes. Jag ska stanna här hos dig. Du ska se att det kommer att bli skönt. Jag har så hemskt ont. Den är så varm. Vi kan ta den andra kudd. Mm. Kom, ska du se. Orkar du resa det lite? Så. Mm. Mm. Kan du hasa ner lite så? Mm. Lite bättre mm. så. Lite bra så. 
You're so snell, mot mig. Anna, played by Carrie Silwyn, touches Agnes with every part of her body. Her face, her lips, her hands, and above all, her breast, which she offers to the stricken woman as she would to an infant in need of the warmth and comfort of the maternal body. Although Agnes now faces death with religious acceptance, she also is, at certain moments such as this, frightened, especially, she says, during the night, when even Karen tells Anna she hears strange sounds uh, that give her chills. Night is the most terrifying moment for Agnes. Anna promises to stay with Agnes, and she allays her terror as a mother would a child. But Bergman makes it clear in this scene that the maternal touch that Agnes longs for and that Anna is giving her is not just comforting, but it is highly sensual, powerfully erotic, much as Freud argues for a sexual gratification in a mother's bond with a child. Now, when Agnes' condition grows worse, Anna awakens Maria and Karen, who find the dying woman groaning and unconscious uh, in what seems like the throes of her final moments of life. The two sisters back away, Karen to call the doctor, Maria backs away and is paralyzed with that same expression of horror that she showed toward her bleeding husband. Anna's anguish is so intense that even Anna now seems frightened by it. But a cut brings us to a shot of Agnes, surprisingly, peacefully asleep. And when she awakens, Bergman presents the only scene in which the sisters, Karen and Maria and uh, Agnes, are together in a moment of sisterly warmth. Because Karen and Maria now express a warm compassion of the kind that Agnes has always wanted to believe they were capable of. It doesn't last long, but it is a reprieve. Have a look. I'm much better now. Say a little bit. Vill du att vi ska tvätta dig lite? Ta på ett rent linne. Ja, tack. Är lite törstig. Ja. Ska jag läsa lite? Ja, det får så roligt. Ja. fjärde kapitlet i vilket Mr. Pickwick anser det klokast att resa till Bath och följaktligen reser. 
Men min bästa sör sa det lilla pöker då han dagen efter rättegången befann sig hos Mr. Pickwick. Det måtte väl aldrig vara ert allvar nu sedan er vrede lagt sig att vägra betala skadeståndet. Inte ett öre sa det Mr. Pickwick i bestämd ton. Inte ett öre. Now it's important to note that this idol of unity and tranquility and touch is possible only because Agnes is now quiescent. She's not repulsive. She's not shrieking in pain uh, as if she were a source of contamination as she had been earlier. Like the scent of the rose, this is a moment for Agnes of sensual contact that she cherishes. But it is one, of course, that quickly passes. Yet, while it lasts, after the cries and the whispers that have preceded this scene, what we have here is silence. We don't even hear in this scene the relentless ticking of the clocks that have so constantly reminded us of Agnes's imminent death. As Agnes receives a sponge bath, Bergman presents the four women in a single image, a tableau that recalls paintings of women washing the body of Christ after he was deposed from the cross. Maria and Karen help Agnes change her nightgown, and Karen brushes Agnes's hair. Maria reads to her from Dickens, the Pickwick Papers, until the sick woman falls asleep. It's as if, for a moment, they were children again, momentarily washed of the bitterness and the loss in their lives that the flashbacks reveal, all together again in their childhood home. The scene is strangely dreamlike, almost too idyllic to believe. And indeed, as Anna watches, she seems fascinated, but also slightly hesitant, uh, bewildered, uncertain of what to make of this unexpected, this uncharacteristic display of tenderness that seems difficult to process and believe. Well, as I said, it's brief. The scene, you'll recall, began with a close-up of the sleeping Agnes, but it ends with the sound of a normal temporality returning, the image of a ticking clock as she lies again in bed, suggesting that the scene was somehow outside the flow of normal time. Uh, but that now, alas, ordinary time and the customary conduct that they have shown within uh, the world of the film thus far is returning. A moment later, as the sisters wait in the salon, Agnes begins her final agony, or perhaps her penultimate agony, depending how we, how we read the scene of her apparent return to life. Bergman spares the viewer nothing here as Anna expires in anguish. Have a look.
in the face of Agnes sh Agnes's shriek, I can't take it anymore, and her cry for help, Maria reverts to her usual horrified retreat. Karen forces herself to the bedside, more out of duty than love, holding a vomit basin, while Anna supports the dying woman in her final breaths. The red here is the color of, uh, uh, among other things, Maria's hysterical fear. It is the color expressionistically of Anna's compassionate love, and it is most obviously the color of Anna's long, drawn-out suffering. But now, the suffering abruptly ceases as Agnes dies gazing at Anna. Anna then proceeds to cover Agnes's entire body with her own. And yet, curiously, the only woman who is weeping is not Maria out of grief, uh, but rather it is, excuse me, it is not uh, Anna uh, or Karen uh, out of grief, but Maria is the only one who is weeping. And she's weeping not out of grief, but out of fear at the spectacle of death. She's a child. Uh, as Anna and Karen place Agnes's body in repose, Maria is even afraid to touch her sister's corpse. She cringes in the background. Well, black clothing now replaces the white that we've seen on these women as the Lutheran pastor arrives to deliver what begins as a conventional eulogy over the deceased, but becomes a tortured challenge to the God who took Agnes's life, quote, in the bloom of youth and after a long and torturous agony to which you submitted patiently and without complaint. Have a look. Om det är så att du samlat vårt lidande i din stackars kropp. Om det är så att du burit det med dig genom döden. Om det är så att du möter Gud där borta i det andra landet. Om det är så att han vänder sitt ansikte mot dig. Om det är så att du då kan tala det språk som denne Gud fattar. Om det är så att du då kan tala till denne Gud. Om det är så. Bed för oss. Agnes kära lilla barn. Lyssna till vad jag nu säger dig. Bed för oss som är här kvar. På den mörka smutsiga jorden. Under en tom och grym himmel. Lägg din börda av lidande vid Gudens fot. Och be honom att benåda oss. Be honom äntligen befri oss ur vår ängslan, vår leda och vårt djupa tvivel. Be honom om en mening med våra liv. Agnes, du som har lidit så ofattligt och så länge. Du måste vara värdig att föra vår talan. Hon var mitt konfirmationsbarn. Vi hade ofta långa och ingående samtal. Hennes tro var starkare än min. The minister daringly compares Agnes to Christ when addressing her as if she could hear him. He says, you gathered up our suffering in your poor body as if she, in her courage and goodness, serves as a scapegoat uh, for the evils and the suffering of the others, um, as if somehow she is atoning for their sins. Now, the minister seems to invoke this comparison to Christ in an attempt to make some sense of what he calls Agnes's, quote, inscrutable suffering, suffering that makes no sense. The phrase points to the uh, discontentment, the deep discontentment that the minister feels at the premature death of a woman whom he confirmed, um, a protracted suffering that in his mind challenges the justice of the God who demands it. Agnes's death has cast the minister into a state of furious religious doubt. Thus he asks Agnes when she meets God if she is permitted to speak to him in that other world to implore God to free those like himself who live with such doubts because they feel, quote, 
left behind in the dark on this miserable earth beneath a cruel, empty sky. Now, there is no evidence of God in that cruel, empty sky, and the prayer articulates in suggesting that a recurrent theme in Bergman's films, God's invisibility and the question of divine justice in a world in which there are no traces of God. Why, if God exists, Bergman constantly asks, would he create a world so filled with human suffering from which he has so mysteriously absented himself? Well, despite the minister's hopes, there is unfortunately no suggestion of religious redemption here through Anna. Uh, the other characters are not transformed, it seems, or in any way uh, spiritualized by her death. It's a measure of the minister's doubt about God that he says of Agnes, her faith was stronger than mine. Um, his description of life's emptiness and cruelty prompts a close-up of Karen, who now recalls her own life of misery and loss of faith, all of it distilled in a terrible scene with her husband years earlier in the third of the film's five interpolated flashbacks. And like Agnes's and Maria's, this memory is set at the manor house where Karen and her husband were staying for a few days. Have a look. Det var en herre av längder. Allt ihop. Säg inte på mig. Säg inte på mig sådär, säg jag. Förlåt. Förlåt mig. Hjälp mig med klänningen.
Karen's considerably older, rather desiccated husband is a diplomat who embodies patriarchy at its coldest and most oppressive. The dinner we see them consuming draws on the visual language of scriptural meals with images of wine and fish. Uh, again, Christianity is metaphor, but Bergman does this merely to overturn the notion of communion here in any sense. Nothing is shared at this meal, and the absence in the virtual silence of the eating, the absence of any spousal love on either side, is suggested by their positions at opposite ends of this rather long table, as well as by the absence of conversation. We hear only the ticking of clocks and the clink of silverware. In her suppressed rage at her husband, Karen, played brilliantly by Ingrid Thulin, uh, often in Bergman films, Karen accidentally shatters her wine glass. It is a displacement of the smothered hostility she feels toward her husband as he's consuming his meal with rigid formality while she stares at him with a contempt as cold as his own bearing. As she examines a broken shard of the glass, a close-up reveals an idea flickering across her features. She speaks of life as a web of lies. She's referring not just to the lie that is her marriage, but also to the lies of the rigid class-bound customs and manners that have defined and circumscribed her life. They're all empty. They're all lies. She is as discontented as her mother was and as angry. Now, like Maria and like her mother then, um, Karen feels constricted. Uh, but her own form of rebellion against patriarchal confinement is the antithesis of Maria's masquerade of femininity. In fact, Karen's response is a denial both of femininity and of sexual pleasure. She takes the glass shard to her bedroom, and when she sees that Anna has noticed the expression on her face and the fact that she's taken this piece of glass and is looking at her in the mirror with concern as she stands in the back, when Karen sees that, she feels exposed, she feels vulnerable, as if Anna knows what she is planning, as indeed it appears she may. We see both Karen and Anna reflected in the mirror in a two-shot that suggests Anna's terrible understanding. By slapping this family servant, Karen enforces the very class codes that she despises, and she hates herself for doing it. But no sooner does she beg Anna's forgiveness and Anna seems unforgiving, then Karen orders Anna to undress her. She is simply unable to free herself from the class habits that are entwined with her hatred of her husband and her own life and of herself. Examining the glass shard carefully, she cuts herself with it in an act of genital mutilation. This shocking gesture has manifold implications, layers of meaning, I think. In part, it's a transference of Karen's psychic pain, unbearable mental pain, to a physical sight, as if self-injury could somehow divert her from her mental distress. But the cutting is also specifically directed against the sight of her female sexuality and the possibility of any erotic pleasure there. As a self-inflicted punishment, then, for the moral contamination of enduring sex, it seems that it is directed against herself. Um, after all, her husband that very night uh, expects her to perform sexually, and the very thought disgusts her. Uh, she hates her body and she hates herself uh, that it has been used sexually. In fact, when Karen comes into her husband's room and he mistakenly assumes she's come to provide uh, sex uh, as a kind of duty, he is, of course, appalled and surprised. Now, the cutting is also directed against Karen's womb, against the principle of childbearing as a defining aspect of her womanhood, but also a kind of denial of life, this woman who finds the entire fact of life to be nothing but a web of lies. Uh, the idea of bringing a child into the world, of being capable of it, disgusts her. The gesture then constitutes uh, Karen's refusal to reproduce in a world that she despises. More important, though, I think, again, within this uh, layered uh, reading, more important, Karen cuts herself as a flagrant act of aggression 
and revenge against her husband. She forces him to see the blood, and then she smears it on her face in order to punish him for the life in which he has imprisoned her, to which he has subjected her. It is also, one might say, a dramatic reminder of the psychic wounds he has inflicted on her through the repressive power and gendered expectations of patriarchy. Finally, beyond all of what I have suggested, I think the self-cutting is a flagrant attack on her husband's manhood. In this sense, the sight of a woman's bleeding genitals is, Freud tells us, for a man always a reminder of menstrual blood that men traditionally find repugnant and find imp repugnant in part uh, because blood in the genital area is a reminder for the male of what Freud describes as the little boy's traumatic discovery of his mother's uh, condition, of the bleeding wound between her legs rather than the phallus he expects. The little boy, when he sees the naked mother, is seized with castration anxiety upon seeing the mother's naked body and absent phallus because he assumes the father has removed it and the father could remove his. Thus, this uh, deep psychic connection. Well, by marking her face with blood, Karen forces her husband always to see her this way, always, she hopes it would seem, to have the fear-inducing memory of that blood, that atavistic gesture. Uh, that mocks him as a male, that mocks the decorous class codes that have defined him and their marriage. Now, it is not just her husband whose touch repels Karen. It's all human touches, as if she associates any physical contact, male or female, with the kind of violation of her body that she fears and loathes and feels both enraged and guilty about. Now, we see this fear of touch. When Maria approaches Karen and asks her to be friends, when she complains, I want us to be friends, Karen, how strange that we never touch. Well, unfortunately, at this very moment, uh, Maria is in need of emotional and physical intimacy at a moment when Karen has just recalled in this flashback her bloody withdrawal from all corporeal contact. Karen, not surprisingly, retreats from her sister here. But she reads then a passage from Agnes's diary in which the dead woman extolled the joys of physical contact and companionship with her sisters as, quote, a wonderful gift, a gift of grace from God. Moved by these words, Karen reluctantly allows Maria to embrace her, to stroke her face, even though she warns, I can't stand to be touched. But what seems like a breakthrough inspired by Agnes's words end in Karen's sudden and violent withdrawal. She tears herself away from Maria when Maria tries to kiss her on the lips. Quote, I don't want you to be kind to me, she tells Maria. Life is hell. I can't stand the anguish and the guilt. Well, what does she mean specifically by guilt at this moment? Something, I think, that has to do with the fact that in being embraced and the approach of a kiss fills her with a sense that her body might be a site of pleasure and is certainly a site of desire on its own. I think it's a moment in which she feels guilty, if you will, for having a body and having desires. It's also remorse, I think, of the kind that um, she recalls at ever having submitted to sexual intimacy with her husband and the charade of their marriage uh, uh, and uh, guilt over her own sexual womanhood that she had tried to abnegate with a shard of glass um, at this moment. Thus, the sense of guilt has to do with her own body, her own desires, and with her submission to her husband in the past all at once. Not that Maria understands much of this. Now, I've noted also then that Maria's embrace and impending kiss threaten to arouse a sexual need in Karen that she fears and despises in herself uh, and um, that make it intolerable. She doesn't want in any way to be reawakened in the body. She doesn't want to recognize the body. She doesn't want to be reawakened into life, which she despises so much that she tells Maria, 
I have often thought of taking my own life. Clearly, then, the kiss that Marie attempted was a step too far, and perhaps a selfish one, uh, as uh, Maria's uh, gestures generally tend to be. In her fear and anxiety over Agnes's death, Maria is seeking once more physical touch, but she's seeking here more than just sisterly intim intimacy and mutual support. Um, she is also clearly, Maria, craving and asking for sexual relief that she normally finds with men through a kind of erotic kiss with her sister. Karen backs away. Now, I'll complete my analysis of Cries and Whispers in the first half of my next lecture and then turn to Kubrick and Dr. Strangelove in the second part.